Hi, this is Dr. Tony Cooper, and this is Life Without Baggage. In this podcast, I'll help you develop a stronger sense of self, develop firmer boundaries, and also learn how to lean into the gentle promptings of the Holy Spirit who can help you navigate life. I have dozens of bonus videos posted that will help you in these areas and also will help you develop stronger coping skills. In each of the program notes, there's a link where you can request a free digital devotional book that I've written, where you can find my other media, and also where you can find my books on Amazon. A reminder before we get into today's episode that this is not a substitute for medication or counseling. If you're having thoughts of harming yourself or another person, or if this material triggers you, please contact your doctor or a mental health specialist to help you with your concerns. Now here's today's episode. In this series on understanding narcissism, I've been focusing for the last several video podcasts here on how to protect yourself and especially how to protect yourself through your connection with the Lord. So Last time we talked about practicing the presence of God, and today we're going to focus on a deeper understanding of the goodness of God, because that's going to motivate you to draw closer to him, to yield more of your life to him, and to trust the Lord when he's giving you direction. As I mentioned before, I did a whole series on names of God. Jesus is our shepherd our healer, our righteousness hosted back in October, November, December of 2022. And then there was one in 2023. So first I want to tell you a little bit about myself. If you don't already know, one of the reasons that I'm pretty fascinated about our view of God and the goodness of God is that I was raised in church But the church I attended really emphasized rules, learning the rules of the church, following the rules of the church. And my sense about God was that he was very easy to anger. He had a lot of expectations and you better not mess up. So so that's pretty fear-based and maybe you weren't raised that way, but that was that was a lot of indoctrination where there was no balance with the goodness or the love of God. It was all rules, rules, rules. And so I called that the law. And really, if you think about the Pharisees, they were all about rules and they were the ones who murdered Jesus. Another thing about me is earlier in my life, I had a lot of trouble with depression and I had uh, a significant bout with depression for about a year and a half in my 20s. And when I started to come out of it, one of the verses that really spoke to me was Hebrews 11, 6. And that verse says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For those who would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And again, based on the way I was raised and the teachings about God that I had received growing up, my sense was that God was never satisfied, that you had to always work harder, work harder, work harder. And boy, you better better not mess up. And if you did, you better apologize about a million times. And so that verse just screamed at me. It's like, wow, he wants to reward me. And if you think about how you interact with a child, When you love a child, you want them to do what's right. You correct them when they do something wrong, but you're eager to reward them when they've been cooperative, when they've done something that you know is kind of difficult for them. You you want to reward them. You want them to be happy. So God wants us to mature, but he also wants us to be happy. So more about God's goodness. So I want to share some verses with you that talk about God's goodness, because these are verses that have meant a lot to me and really helped me shift over the years of how I viewed God, how I moved from seeing God as very harsh and 
full of expectations and easily angered to seeing God as more patient and loving and um, responsive to my needs. This is Psalm 41, verse 13. I like to read from the Amplified. For I, the Lord, your God, hold your right hand. I am the Lord who says to you, fear not, I will help you. And there are a number of other verses, Isaiah 45, 1, Isaiah 42, 6, Psalm 37, verse 24, that all say something very similar, that God holds our hand. So that's very tender, isn't it? That God holds our hand. He's affectionate towards us. Now, this is Isaiah 49, and I think I'm going to read 15 and 16. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should not have compassion on the child of her womb? Even though they may forget, I will not forget you. So you think about how close you hold a child that's nursing. I have indelibly imprinted, tattooed a picture of you on the palm of each of my hands. So that's pretty amazing. I don't think I have ever had a boyfriend or anyone that tattooed my name (laughs) on any part of them. But God has tattooed a reminder. He's imprinted a picture of us on his hand. And I've heard that explained as when Jesus was crucified, there were nails in both of his hands. And even in the resurrected Jesus, he did not have the wounds removed. They're a, an eternal reminder of his love for us and his payment for our sin. So that almost moves me to tears. So we see different ways that God is tenderly affectionate towards us. We're told in James chapter 1, verse 17, that there's no shadow, there's no shading of God. He's all light. And what that means is he doesn't change. He doesn't get tired of us. His affections don't go up and down. Um, I don't know whether you've had a situation, you probably have, where you thought you knew somebody, a partner, a friend, and all of a sudden they do something that is just so damaging and and malicious. And you think, where did that come from? Well, God isn't like that. He's always consistent. He's always loving. He's always kind. Now he wants us to do what's right. And there might be consequences on earth if we make some bad decisions, but that doesn't mean he enjoys punishing us. But in the natural course of things, whether you follow God or not, Decisions have consequences, but we need to remember, even if we've done something wrong, that God does not delight in punishing us. He's not looking for ways to punish us. He loves us. So if you ever had a coach or a teacher or a parent who looked for reasons to punish you and then delighted in delivering the harshest punishment possible, that's not God. God is loving. He wants to restore us. He wants us to stay on track, just like we would want our children to stay on track. But he loves us and he wants our good. It says in Numbers 23, 19, that he doesn't lie. So you can count on God that he means what he says. If he says something in his word, he means it. And so he's not going to try to trick us into, okay, now you trust me. Now I'm going to do something terrible to you. Those bad things don't come from God. He doesn't change. In Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 34, the Lord is called our redeemer. And there are many, many, many places in scripture where he talks about being our redeemer, being our strong tower. And let me give you a personal example again of where the Lord showed up for me. So um, I think it was the last podcast I mentioned, there were a whole bunch of things happening this summer that were very chaotic and stressful, and they've taken time to resolve. I wanted them, of course, God, please resolve this, you know, like today, but it took time. There was a lot of 
a lot of pressure and a lot of chaos. And I kept declaring based on that I know God loves me and then he doesn't send evil to me. That Hebrews 11, three, that you've heard me quote, that Lord, your word puts everything in order. So I thank you. You are bringing order into my life. You are straightening this out. That Lord, you contend with those who contend with me, that you want order and peace. So I thank you that you are establishing, you are vindicating, you are correcting these things that you know are wrong. And over time, the Lord has brought some beautiful resolution. It took a few months, but it's happened. So I am very thankful for that. But if you don't believe in God's goodness, you're going to think God is fighting you, that he's mad at you, that he doesn't care. But again, it, it tells us in Matthew that rain and storms come to the righteous and the unrighteous. It's part of life as long as we're on earth. But God is always in our corner and we can keep turning to him even when we sin, even when we fail, we can keep turning to him and he restores us and he goes to bat for us and he helps us in the things that are too big for us. So I want to talk a little bit more about how we get to know God's goodness through his names. If you think about a name means something. So for me, at work, I'm Dr. Cooper. To my friends, I'm Tony. There are people in my life that have a nickname for me. It's that connection. We have a different connection. It's affection. So names mean something. They represent uh, the connection. And in the Bible, a name stands for the person. It's like your reputation. If you have a good name, if you have a good reputation, then people can count on you. If you have a bad reputation, a bad name, people avoid you or watch out for you. And so I want to talk a little bit about what it means to understand who God is, his goodness, his names. So I'm going to read to you a little bit from my book, Sheep Hear His Voice. Uh, this is page 47 about calling on the names of God. When we speak to God using one of the names that he uses to describe himself, we're showing affection to him, but we also are recognizing that he can meet any kind of need. Sometimes I need him to be the good shepherd. That's Psalm 23. Sometimes I need him to be the lion of Judah who gives me courage and fights for me. I recognize God as my king who can give me direction by opening or closing doors when I need to make a decision. I've also talked about how Jesus is the breaker. We learned that in Micah 2.13. He breaks barriers down for us that shouldn't be there. So as I learn to meditate on his names, recognize who he is, that he's the lamb of God who paid for my sins, that he's the wonderful counselor, it says in Isaiah 9, 6, that he's the prince of peace. He's the one who can give me peace when everything around me is chaotic, that it helps me shift into my spirit. It helps me draw close to him. And then I'm able to hear him, to understand who he is, his goodness, his love for me. And that gives me courage and comfort for each step that I need to take. So what can we do to draw on God's goodness, to get that deep into our hearts and minds, deep into our spirits? We've talked about meditating on uh, different passages that talk about who God is. Again, I mentioned the series of podcasts I did on the names of God at the end of 2022. Uh, there's music, there's worship songs. When when I really need something, sometimes there's a worship song that talks about that aspect of God, and I'll just play that over and over so that I really drink it in, so that I allow God to shift how I view things at an emotional level. Music gets at that emotional level. I shift. It helps me move, accelerate the progress. And it helps me worship him, to love him better. He loves us well, 
but we have to learn how to love him. And the better we know him, the easier it is to love him. That just makes sense. That's true with people. And so it's true of God too, because we're made in his image. And it's really important to forgive those who have wronged us. Now, when I say forgive, I don't mean trust. There are things that we learn that show us this person cannot be trusted. But for our well-being, we don't want to carry resentments. Resentments tie you to another person. That's why they're bad for us. That's why we're commanded not to be resentful. It's toxic to us spiritually. It's toxic emotionally. It affects all our relationships when we hold grudges. So we want to release that. Again, it's not the same as trust, but it interferes with us seeing God clearly. So we want everything in our spiritual life to be clean so that there's a flow that can happen so that we are free to receive and that God's love can overflow through us and that we can be carriers of his presence that we can have an impact in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our place of business, in our culture. So I know it's difficult, but it's good for us to choose to forgive. It's not an emotion. It's a choice. If you're waiting for the emotions, you've heard me say, they're not coming. So it's a choice. It's an act of the will. And over time, the emotions will calm. And what I've done a number of times when I've had really deep uh, betrayals is I choose to forgive. I ask the Lord to take the anger and the pain into his body on the cross because it doesn't just vanish. It has to go someplace. So I release it to the Lord because he's good and he paid for this on the cross. And then I stand on his promises, Lord, Will will you restore my soul? You say in Psalm 23 that you restore my soul. Will you restore the places in me that have been deeply wounded by, I mean, I mentioned the name. He knows who I'm talking about. Or I'll quote the verse in Joel. Lord, you say that you restore what the locusts have eaten, the things that devour our happiness. Lord, I'm asking you to restore those places in my soul, in my relationships where I've been wounded. So I choose to forgive. I release it to the Lord. I take it to him to take into his body on the cross. That's from Isaiah 53. And then I ask him to restore what's been broken, what's been wounded, maybe what's been lost that he can restore that. He's the redeemer and he's good. So I'm going to say a short blessing for us uh, based on God's goodness. So Lord, I thank you that you love us, that you are good, that you attend to us, that you delight in us, that you sing over us, it says in Zephaniah, and that you love to hear our squeaky voices sing to you, that you are good and you look for ways to reward us. So I pray that the person who's listening right now and for myself, for a deeper understanding of your goodness and your tender affection for us and your willingness to restore us when we fail. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is Dr. Tony Cooper, and this is Life Without Baggage. Thanks for listening. And if this helped you, Share it with a friend. Talk to you next time.